Kevin Rudd was Australia's former prime minister, and well before that career, he was and is very much a sinologist, a specialist in China with a PhD on Xi Jinping. He is also author of The Avoidable War, The Dangers of Catastrophic Conflict Between the U.S. and Xi Jinping's China. Here's our interview. We're very happy to have in the studio Kevin Rudd, Australia's Prime Minister from 2007 to 2010. Uh, Mr. Rudd, the fact that you wrote this book means you think there is enough of a concern of a potential conflict. Why is that? Well, I've been studying China itself and U.S.-China relations for the last 35 years. And I've been a diplomat in the past. I've been Foreign Minister, Prime Minister, and dealt with China and the U.S. a lot. Uh, it's the first time I've become really worried about the real prospect of armed conflict between these two, probably over Taiwan. And so the purpose of the book is to say, here are some suggestions about how to avoid crisis, conflict and war by accident. And here are some thoughts about how to avoid war by intent uh, later on. Um, I wonder, there's a number of books. Uh, Susan Shirk just came out with one. Um, looking at trying to avoid a potential conflict. Do you know if there's an equivalent in China of uh, books where they talk about trying to avoid conflict with the United States? And I ask this because I wonder whether there's too much of an onus on the United States or democracies to try to prevent uh, conflict with China, especially when we see Beijing being more and more aggressive. The bottom line is the party, the Communist Party, lays out the line. That's why we studied carefully the Congress report of Xi Jinping at the 20th Party Congress. It lays out the line. There's nothing in the line about avoiding crisis, conflict and war. There's everything in the line about the inevitability of China's rise, the inevitability of, you know, Zhonghua Minzu, Wei Da Fuxing, the great renaissance of the Chinese people, code language for becoming the preeminent regional and global power by mid-century. The line is clear that China must prepare for uh, dangers in times of peace and also prepare for the storm. So that's the script being delivered internally. So therefore, um, in the rest of the world, uh, obviously there's a predisposition to seek to avoid war. Uh, I'm in that camp. Uh, I think war is generally a pretty bad thing if you've got any mind for history. But I think where the intersection of the interests between China and the US lie is avoiding war by accident in the near term and using deterrence to prevent war uh, in the long term. So these are the two, as it were, strands of the argument outlined in that book. And are you reassured, based on what you understand, that there are Chinese counterparts thinking about this as well? Well, on the question of the avoidable war and using exit ramps or guardrails or rules of the road, as I describe them in the book, to prevent uh, accidental crisis, conflict, escalation and war, yes, there is a constituency within Beijing, certainly alive within the think tanks which service the central leadership. Um, I don't believe that the um, Chinese side right now have an interest in going to war. There's a reason for that. Uh, it's because they are concerned they might lose. Um, or they're concerned that the financial and economic penalty against China for so doing would be too great. So therefore the challenge now is to avoid this escalation, crisis, conflict and war by accident, for which there is a constituency, I think, in both sides of this relationship. Uh, but for the long term, uh, Xi Jinping, if you look carefully at the 20th Party Congress report, is saying that national reunification is inevitable. He's also said earlier it has to be achieved in effect by 2049. Um, and one key phrase he uses in the work uh, report is the, uh, the wheels of history are grinding forward towards the inevitability of reunification. That's pretty intense language. Before we delve further into that, I do want to talk about uh, Australia. Of course, any potential conflict between the United States and China would have a big impact on your country. Um, what is your worry for Australia in that instance? Well, no larger worry for Australia than Germany, for example, uh, or for any middle to large economy in the world. I think there are two immediate consequences. One, the United States would have an immediate expectation of its allies to support the United States under such a, a scenario which had the Chinese taking military action to take China by force. The second is 
whether or not countries militarily participate or not in that action. The, there would be an expectation of the United States for all allies and partners of the US worldwide to roll out comprehensive financial and economic sanctions. And I think the third implication is that whatever happens with A or B above, uh, you would plunge the global economy into the deepest of recessions, probably a depression, because these are the world's two largest economies. Like the combined financial markets at this stage between these two countries is five trillion dollars out of a hundred trillion dollar global economy. Now that's a lot of bucks. Suddenly all that grinds to an immediate halt. Trade is stopped. Foreign direct investment stops. The rest of the world looks at it and takes fright. So throwing the global economy into something close to a depression will be the third consequence for all economies, European or Asian. And of course, we've seen just how devastating uh, the impact on, on uh, dealing with Russia, which is a much smaller economy, and then China has been on uh, the world. I want to talk about Xi Jinping and the Congress, uh, but uh, I want to go back to your time as prime minister, because I think it really tells us how much things have changed with mm. China over the past decade. Um, I was foreign correspondent in China when you were prime minister. And um, some would say, looking back at that time, uh, with you, but also with the Obama administration, Merkel's engagement with China, that leaders were relatively sanguine um, in hindsight. Is that an assessment that you would agree with and, and do you think your views have changed? The strategy employed by ourselves at the time, and I know it because I wrote it, um, and certainly by the Obama administration because I knew Barack very well and worked with him closely on US strategy, and I also worked with Chancellor Merkel, um, was not unconditional engagement with China. It was engagement plus hedge. And the engagement was fully... Um, uh, working with the Chinese on the global, as it were, commons, global governance, maximising mutual economic benefit, maximising mutual economic responsibility, working on common challenges together. And the expectation was that the Chinese would move towards uh, inclusion into the existing rules-based system minus democracy. OK? I don't think that was ever a realistic aspiration for anybody, certainly not mine. I think what happened uh, with the rise of Xi Jinping is China's own playbook changed. The, the uh, China of Xi Jinping is radically different from the China of Hu Jintao, of Jiang Zemin and even Deng Xiaoping. Don't take my word for it, read the 20th Party Congress report. It talks about the Xin Shidae, a new era. And the Lao Shidae, the old era, was that 25, 35 years of Gai Ge Kaifang, reform and opening. So this is a brand new China domestically and a more assertive China internationally. Has this surprised you? Was there a moment where you realised that things were not going in the direction that a lot of people anticipated? I think there are two things which stand out for me. One on pure politics. Now, if you look carefully at Xi Jinping's leaked speech uh, on ideology and propaganda in July of uh, 2013, this is an undiluted, uh, no holds barred, uh, knock them down, knock them down, drag them out, fight with everything that the West and the United States and the democratic world holds to be near and dear in terms of freedom and the international order based on that. And when it was leaked, it became very plain that uh, Xi Jinping was taking a completely different course on the international system. And secondly, the reassertion of Marxist-Leninist ideology, because his conclusion in that speech was that the loss of the centrality of Marxist-Leninism was what actually caused the decline of the Communist Party, the Soviet Union, and the collapse of the Soviet Union altogether. So that was a big one. And after 2017 and the 19th Party Congress, there was a shift on economic ideology as well. Now, um, it's almost a cottage industry in the foreign affairs world in terms of prognostications with China, uh, the coming collapse of China and so on and so forth. But she is facing headwinds with the economy and so on and so forth. So uh, what would be your prognostication with China? Well, uh, there is a debate at the moment about whether we're now looking at peak China. That is, a China whose adjustment to the Deng Xiaoping economic model of the last 35 years towards a new Xi Jinping economic model with greater emphasis on the party, greater emphasis on the state, greater emphasis on industrial policy and planning and common prosperity, that this in fact will so radically slow China's growth rate that it won't be growing at 5 or 6% for the 20s and 30s. It's more likely to be growing at 
three or four or two to three. That makes a quantum difference if you're looking at the cumulative impact of growth rates over time. I think it's too early to tell whether uh, Xi Jinping can recover mm -hmm. the economic model, but the early signs from the 20th Party Congress report is that the ideological uh, orientation back towards the party, the state and ideology that we saw in the 19th Party Congress, that has been, if you like, intensified in this Congress report. So I'm not foreshadowing any policy U-turn back to the market. So therefore, we're going to have a slower growth rate, natural growth rate for China. They may prop it up through high levels of state investment. They may continue to yield activity through net exports. But private fixed capital investment, private consumption, as well as private residential construction, I think are all heading in a southerly direction. Yeah, I mean, the economy is, at the end of the day, um, the most basic thing and it's something that the party is very, very concerned with. Now, with this Congress, it doesn't look like it's... Um, on, on the political front, though, uh, we're not seeing any relaxation at all, are we? It looks like he's doubling down on more autocracy and so on and so forth. I think if you look carefully at what the Congress report says, it's quite clear that the political and economic line and, frankly, the foreign policy line are being sustained. We do not see a radical change in any of those, except that on the economy, it is somewhat more hardline ideologically. And on foreign policy, somewhat more alarmist in terms of China's perception of its deteriorating strategic environment. Mr Kevin Rudd, thank you so much for joining us. Good to be on Deutsche Welle.